we are going to be looking at one of the most famous monologues in history, and it's from the play Twelfth Night. We're going to be looking at the main characters you need to know in the context of this monologue, and then we're going to do a deep dive into the language behind the monologue. In order for you to understand this monologue, you really need to know the four main characters of this play. Now, there are quite a few main characters, but just for the purpose of this monologue, we need to know four of them. So we've got Duke Orsino, who does the monologue. So he's a powerful nobleman in the country of Illyria. Orsino is lovesick for Lady Olivia, but truthfully, he is in love with the idea of being in love. He becomes fond of his new page boy, Cesario, and when Cesario's true disguise is revealed, he marries Viola. Then we have Viola. So she's the twin sister of Sebastian. Viola is a young woman of high birth who becomes shipwrecked in a storm and washes up on the shores of Illyria. She disguises herself as a man and calls herself Cesario because she knows she'll be more protected in the disguise of a man. She becomes Duke Orsino's page. Orsino orders her to woo Olivia for him, but Viola ends up falling in love with the Duke. So we've got this kind of love triangle going on in this story, which makes it just such a pleasure to watch. And the, the comedy and the gender fluidity, it's just brilliant. So if you haven't seen it, you know, in person, go and see this play. Alternatively, there's an amazing film adaptation. I'll link to that in the show notes. Then we have Sebastian. So Sebastian is Viola's long lost twin brother who's also shipwrecked and ends up on the shores of Illyria later on in the play. Olivia is a beautiful and wealthy noble lady of Illyria who's being courted by Duke Orsino. Or at least Duke Orsino thinks he's courting her. She's kind of like, uh -uh, I'm grieving for my brother and I will only start dating again seven years from hence. Um, so when Viola is ordered by Orsino to woo Olivia for him, Olivia ends up falling in love with Viola's disguise, Cesario. Whew, that's confusing. Um, just make sure you know who's playing who, who's in the disguise of what, and just kind of, I find it really useful to just write down the names and three bullet points of the main purpose of each character. Now for the best bit. We're about to jump into the monologue and I decided, usually, usually I would read this. Usually I just read it like I do, do my poetry analyses. But this time I thought, hey, this is a play. This is a character who has motives, dreams, ambitions. And I really wanted to kind of get into this character's head. So I thought, what better way to do that than to act the monologue out, to channel his emotions in the moment and kind of see what comes up. So that's exactly what I did. Take a look. music be the food of love. Play on. Give me excess of it. It's surfeiting the appetite me sicken and so die. Let's train again. What kind of dying for? Oh, it came oh my ears like the sweet sound that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and giving odour. Enough! No more. It is not so sweet now as it was before. Spirit of love. How oh, quick and fresh art thou. Then, notwithstanding thy capacity, thou receiveth as the sea. Nought enters there of what validity and pitch so are, but falls into abatement and low price, even in a minute. So full of shapes is fancy. That it alone is high fantastical. So 
Firstly, we have an extended metaphor, and it's not just a metaphor in the sense that it takes place within one line or within a few words. It actually kind of shapes the first three or four lines of this monologue. So if music be the food of love, play on. So this doesn't refer to love itself, but actually it refers to our appetite for love. The Duke compares uh, his lovesickness almost to eating too much. So he wants to kind of gorge himself on music, on the feeling of love, so that somehow he feels, he gets to a point where he feels repulsed by it and he can't eat anymore. He can't take any more of his lovesickness so that this sort of love just dies. You know, he's saying to the musician in the room, if the music makes us desire love more, then keep playing it so I overindulge myself in love until I can't love anymore and hopefully my feelings for Olivia will disappear. The word surfeit is an odd one. Now, it just means uh, to consume an excessive amount. And obviously in this case, he means the music or love. The next literary device is a hyperbole. Now, I kind of had a... Um, I was torn with this one. I was like, is it a hyperbole? Is it a metaphor? And I decided to call it hyperbole because here he's saying, you know, I want my appetite to sicken and die from, from indulging on this love. But, you know, we can't really kill off our appetite literally. We can't murder it, you know? So it's kind of this very uh, overemphasized statement. You know, that's what hyperbole is. It's when a metaphor is kind of taken to the extremes that it can't really happen. Um, so here he's saying, you know, his appetite won't really die, but that's what it wants it to feel like, you know, to stop, to pause, to stop feeling so restless. Now, this isn't really a literary device. It's more of a, it might even be more of a structural technique, but just even pay attention to uh, things like exclamation points and commas and full stops and semicolons because, you know, Shakespeare was very intentional about where he placed them in the text. And here he he places uh, an exclamation mark after that strain again. It's almost as if it's a surprise. It kind of, it sneaks up on Orsino because he's listening to music at this point. Uh, and it's a melancholic tune because he does say, you know, it had a dying fall. We associate death with sadness and grief. He's grieving this sense of lovesickness. It makes him feel so torn and so helpless. And coming from a man, you know, who is, he's a nobleman. He's powerful. He probably feels power in every single element of his life apart from this. This is where he feels powerless. So let's explore that a little bit more. So where there's an exclamatory, you know, he's hearing a piece of the music that just sounds sad and melancholic and it resonates with how he's feeling sorry for himself with the fact that he has this unrequited love for Lady Olivia. Next is sibilance, sweet sound. Now that's said in the line, oh, it came over my ear, like the sweet sound that breathes upon a bank of violets. He's saying, you know, the music resonates with me on a deep and profound level. And it touches his heart the way his feelings of love touch his heart. Then there's personification. I love this example of personification. So that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and giving odour. Describing this sort of beautiful, vibrant landscape of violets blowing in the wind. And as they blow in the wind, they give off this sort of sweet fragrance. But as soon as you smell it, the wind carries it off even further. So it's like that sweet smell is there for an instant and then it's gone. It's gone. And it, it kind of teases you. It, it changes so quickly. And that's how he's describing love. It's kind of this feeling that changes all the time and you can't really put a finger on it. Like the wind, love kind of gives and takes away in an instant. And that's in the words, you know, stealing and giving odour. There. There's this kind of exchange there's also a little Easter egg here, which made me smile. So, Violet's Viola. Viola is actually the woman that the Duke ends up falling in love with, so Shakespeare kind of snuck that one in there for us. We have a second exclamatory, and that's where, that's enough, no more. 
So it's the music is playing in the background and then all of a sudden he, something in the music and the melody just kind of overwhelms him with with grief or sorrow it touches a place in him that's too it's too triggering it's too hurtful so he kind of orders his musicians stop you know that's it i can't i can't deal with this we have a second personification and that's in um personifying love as quick and fresh just means transient you know it comes and changes too quickly and it has the capacity to powerfully devour and destroy even the most precious things this same sentiment is carried through into the next literary device which is a simile so receiveth as the sea there's this kind of opening up you know the sea is vast and it has the potential to swallow you whole you know he can't stop he's saying he can't stop himself from being in love. He can only hold on tight as he's kind of carried away along this tide of desires and emotions which are constantly shifting. The words validity and pitch just refer to these feelings or this love being of high price or high value. And there's this juxtaposition in the next few lines where he says, but falls into abatement and low price you know, you can really hear the plosives there. Plosives are the, the harsh consonant sounds, the B, uh, the P's, you know, but, abatement, low price. He's basically saying, you know, love can sometimes see, seem to make things uh, seem so high value and so high price, but then in a second it changes and it feels so low, like a low price, it becomes worthless in an instant. And abatement, just to clarify that word's meaning, just means something is ending or diminishing or subsiding. We also have sibilance again in the last few lines. So full of shapes. So, so and shapes. So remember sibilance is the repetition of the S sound. Um, so here he's stressing his passion for philosophizing about love. How love has the power to create things conjured by the imagination. He's saying love takes many forms. And interestingly, he falls in love with Viola when she's a boy, when she's in the guise of Cesario. But he doesn't act on that love until she reveals herself in her true form. This is it with Shakespeare monologues. You don't really get an answer to anything. The character just kind of muses, raises loads of questions and puts loads of images in your head and you're kind of just left processing them, you know, just letting them kind of wash through you. Um, so here, kind of my interpretation of this is he's kind of questioning whether, you know, loving certain people because they have a certain energy beauty or power that kind of makes you love them or is love purely in the lover's imagination and interestingly enough it seems Orsino and Olivia are willing to switch lovers quite quickly at the end of the play so this does seem to imply that love is more in the lover's imagination in their mind and that the imagination is more powerful than reality, which is a really cool thought. And just lastly, just to clear up any confusion, fantastical means imagination. Just some final thoughts I want to say about Duke Orsino. You know, he's a nobleman of Illyria. He's chasing after Vi he's tra chasing after Olivia, and I was kind of questioning. I was like, "Why is he sending Viola to woo Olivia for him? But is it it was it usual for servants to be sent by their masters to woo women in Shakespeare's time? I didn't really get an answer to that. Um, it seems kind of to the masters to the duke's discretion some some masters would send their servants out to view, to woo women you know with messages of love and poetry and flowers tokens of love and then other other noblemen would actually directly go and woo the lady themselves and i was kind of thinking why would the duke not woo olivia in person 
And there were a few things that came up. So on the one hand, she's grieving for her dead brother and she's already exclaimed to everyone that she's not willing to date until seven years. So she says she's going to grieve for seven years. She's not going to date anyone. So there's that. There's a there's the sensitive issue of she's in the grieving period. Okay, I will leave her be for now. But then he kind of doesn't leave her be because he gets Cesario to do all the work for him. And he does say to Cesario at a point in the play, you know, you, you have this energy about you that seems so uh, sensitive and you have a high voice and um, you have the this, this softest, sort of sweetest com complexion. I think he says something about her constellation is, is, is right. He's the right person to go and woo Olivia for him. Um, and obviously it's really funny because as he's saying this to, to, to Viola in, in the guise of Cesario, all the audience are probably thinking, okay, <laughs> that's hilarious because he's referring to all her feminine qualities, her face, her soft lips, her high voice. Um, so we're all sort of chuckling away, but the Duke has no idea that Cesario is really a woman. Um... But he's kind of saying your boyish young qualities are going to be, they're not going to be threatening to her. They're quite charming and they're quite sensitive. So I feel like you're the right, you're the right boy for the job. So I was like, okay, I can get behind that idea. That makes sense to me. But also it's just a great plot kind of, it's just a great plot twist, isn't it? Because otherwise that sort of love triangle com comedy that, you know, is unleashed on the whole play, that wouldn't have been able to happen had it not been, uh, had he not sent Cesario to woo Olivia. So that got me thinking about that. And remember as well, the Duke, I, I kind of also thought the Duke, on the other hand, he's a very proud man. He's very, like I said before, he's very powerful in every aspect of his life, but he feels powerless when it comes to love because Olivia is quite, I mean, she's quite harsh with him. She rejects every advance. And there's something in that, is his pride too great? Can he not face the thought of being rejected by this lady in person? So is he kind of softening the blow a little bit? Is he being a bit of a coward by sending a boy to do his job? Maybe. But if you're going to argue that in the exam, just make sure you back it up with some, just with some quotes, with some examples of things he does, maybe some stage directions always give evidence behind every quote that you put, every statement you make, just always give evidence, whether it's a quote or stage direction. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, if you want some extra notes, head to Patreon. Leave a comment below as well, because I'm thinking about doing a Shakespeare series. If you're up for that, please say so in the comments. Give this video a like. And if you want to come and say hey on Instagram, just DM me or comment on one of my photos. I love it when you guys come over there and say hi. Um, plenty of you have done it in the past and it's amazing. It's been really great getting to know some of you. So yeah, I think that is all for now. I'll see you next time.